As we continue into phase two, the main thing to remember here is that depending on how it's depicted, there are, all of these reactions are essentially going to be happening with double the stoichiometry. So out of phase one, out of one molecule of glucose, we do get two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Again, different diagrams will depict this in different ways, but just remember that when we're trying to count how many ATPs do we get out of this, how many NADH do we get out of this, that as we shift from phase one to phase two, we started with six carbons and we still are responsible for following all six carbons, even though now our substrates only have three carbons. One thing that we talked about in bits and pieces in the last couple of videos, but it's worth going ahead and taking a look at overall, is that whenever we're talking about thermodynamics of these diagrams, we can talk about these as far as the standard state free energy, but we can also talk about these in the delta G or just where, where are we with the concentrations that we have. So remember there's that difference between standard state, um, standard gives free energy and just gives free energy. So whenever you remove that circle, you're removing that standard state. So when you look at the top diagram, you see a variety of different things, some exergonic, some endergonic. And as we move to looking at what they are in reality in erythrocytes, what you see is everything's really close to equilibrium, much closer to equilibrium. And we have some things then that are heavily exergonic. So we've actually lost most of those really stark endergonic reactions. And that's really because of the concentrations of the reactants and products. Again, any of those values that you see near to zero are going to be the ones that are very close to equilibrium. And then the ones that you see that have the really large negative delta G values are going to be those that are tied really closely to regulation. So any of those will actually have other components to them. Uh, and I know here we're going to talk about the fact that there's 10 steps in glycolysis and here there's actually an 11th one. That 11th one is going to be lactate dehydrogenase. And we'll talk about that too. As far as the features of the second phase of glycolysis, we are going to have things that we're going to produce four ATPs overall. So we're going to make four of them, but remember we used two in the first phase of glycolysis. So since we used two in those two priming reactions, uh, we're producing four overall, we're going to net two. So we get two ATPs out of glycolysis overall. The other thing as we go through these is there's going to be two high energy phosphate intermediates, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate and phosphoenolpyruvate. These two are going to be such high energy that we're going to get some unique things from them. But first, we're going to go ahead and talk about glyceraldehyde-3-dehydrogenase. So we started off with glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate, and we're going to be oxidizing that to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. So what's going to be happening here is we're going to get an amount of energy yields uh, going from an aldehyde to a carboxylic acid, uh, and that's going to help us make 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, uh, so that is going to make a more high energetic compound, and it's also going to let us create NADH. This mechanism is going to have both covalent catalysis um, and this nicotinamide coenzyme the NAD+, and it's a really good example of uh, the nicotinamide chemistry. We're also going to take a look at what would happen uh, if arsenate was involved in this. And the nice thing with this is you can see the energy is conserved uh, as NADH and this high energy phosphate compound. So again, the oxidation of this aldehyde to carboxylic acid should be really exergonic, should give us a lot of energy, and we're going to capture that. Uh, both in NADH, which we're going to get energy out of later in the tr um, electron transport chain, and with this high energy compound 1,3-BPG. Uh, our phosphate group is going to come from an inorganic phosphate. I have a periodic table on here just to remind you that arsenic is located right below phosphorus on the periodic table. So I know you're going to be like, arsenate, what is that? Uh, and if you just take a deep breath, uh, realize that those arsenic being right below phosphorus is going to let arsenic mimic phosphorus and therefore arsenate is also going to mimic phosphate in this enzyme. If we had arsenate, uh, this can actually be a substrate for this particular enzyme for our dehydrogenase reaction. Uh, and when that happens, you get one arsenate 3 phosphoglycerate. Uh, this will go ahead and continue and break down into 3-phosphoglycerate, so this can actually continue on and produce a product that can continue in uh, glycolysis. But 
uh, it's go it will basically take away the ATP production. So arsenate will basically rob glycolysis of producing ATP. What's going to happen here is the uh, sulfhydryl group of the cysteine is going to go ahead and form that thiohemiacetal, which once that covalent bond is formed, you're then going to go ahead and have that NAD plus um, is going to go ahead and remove a hydride. So that NAD plus is going to be responsible for the oxidation of the substrate. So the substrate here is getting oxidized. Our NAD plus is therefore being reduced from NAD plus to NADH. So therefore, our NAD plus is serving as an oxidizing agent in this mechanism. Once our NAD plus has been reduced, uh, it's gone ahead and is released from the enzyme where then the uh, inorganic phosphate can go ahead and come in uh, and attack that carbonyl carbon uh, and then be added to our substrate, which will then uh, allow it to release off of that uh, cysteine group and then give you that final product of that 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Next reaction, reaction 7, phosphoglycerate kinase. So anytime we have kinase, somehow ATP is going to be involved. Uh, this time we are going to have substrate level phosphorylation because we are going to have a substrate now this time adding a phosphate group to ATP. So we are going to make ATP in this step and we're going to do that from our previous substrate. So we have a really high energy substrate, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, and we're going to remove a phosphate off of it um, to ADP to form ATP. What you'll notice as you see this reaction step done is this does actually have a negative delta G associated with it. Uh, original substrate 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is so high energy that it is able to pass on a phosphate group to ADP. The other thing you should notice, because there are a lot of negative charges happening here, is the presence of magnesium. That magnesium is going to help stabilize the negative charges of the ADP to make that uh, phosphate addition possible. That free energy that therefore is available with that negative delta G value is going to be used to bring the previous three reactions closer to equilibrium. So this, this reaction is going to drive forward uh, very easily and therefore is going to help drag the other three reactions uh, in the more forward direction because of that change of the number of substrates and products. Phosphoglycerate kinase does actually have a somewhat similar shape and some sort of like a similar clamshell ability uh, that we saw in hexokinase as far as that hinge ability to bring things closer together. 2,3-BPG, which we mentioned when we talked about hemoglobin, is actually made by reactions that detour around this phosphoglycerate kinase reaction. To make 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate, you actually start with 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. And then with the use of bisphosphoglycerate mutase, this will actually make 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate. So then that 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate can be used to uh, give hemoglobin that sigmoidal shaped curve for its kinetics that we need for hemoglobin to be able to drop off its oxygen load. And then though, if we're done with our 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate, the 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate phosphatase can then go ahead and remove a phosphate group from it to give us 3-phosphoglycerate, which can then continue down uh, in the glycolytic pathway. Most cells only have a small amount of 2,3-BPG, but erythrocytes, red blood cells, usually have 4 to 5 millimolar. Uh, so this can be something that we have a lot of. For the reaction to actually make 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate, you actually need 3-phosphoglycerate. So what you see here is that it actually are two different molecules. So the first one is that 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, the second one being 3-phosphoglycerate. And then what's actually happening is, is that basically the mutase is shifting around where those phosphates are. But based on the structure and how everything works, it actually needs two molecules in order to pull off this reaction. Reaction 8, phosphoglycerate mutase. So in this reaction, what's going to happen is we're essentially moving a phosphate group from the C3 to the C2 carbon. So a mutase reaction is one that causes the migration of a functional group. You'll notice that this delta G value is fairly close to zero, so fairly close to equilibrium. Uh, and what's going to happen is this is basically going to reposition the phosphate to make phosphatidyl pyruvate uh, in the following reaction, which is going to be one of our more high energy intermediates. Now what's interesting about this is it actually you actually need to prime the enzyme just a little bit. So this phosphoglycerate mutase by itself 
won't do anything. It actually needs a little bit of 2,3-BPG to phosphorylate the histidine to begin with. So let me go ahead and show you the mechanism. So what happens in this mechanism is, is that the histidine that's already phosphorylated, so this histidine's already interacted with 2,3-BPG to get that original phosphate group on there. So once that phosphate group's there, this enzyme's ready to go. Because what's going to happen is this phosphate group is going to go ahead and be attached to our 3-phosphoglycerate, actually then briefly forming 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate, which then the enzyme's going to go ahead and remove the phosphate on the third carbon, and then that goes ahead and rephosphorylates the histidine, and the enzyme's ready to go again. So the enzyme is starts off with a phosphate group on that histidine residue, and it ends with a phosphate on the histidine residue. But it basically exchanges the phosphate with the different positions on the um, on the substrate. Here what you have is a catalytic histidine residue in the active site of E. coli phosphoglycerate mutase. Reaction 9. Enolase. So what we're doing here is enolase is actually going to make phosphoenolpyruvate, which is a fairly high energy intermediate, which will then allow us to actually make ATP in step 10. This though, the, the overall delta G is really low and very close to zero. So how on earth can this actually happen? Uh, the energy content for 2-phosphoglycerate and for phosphoenolpyruvate are actually really similar. It's just a small rearrangement. But that small rearrangement is going to allow us to get more energy uh, when it's uh, hydrolyzed. So all that's really happening here is a small dehydration reaction to get phosphoenolpyruvate. Uh, the main thing that you see here uh, in the reaction mechanism is again the use of histidine. So this does actually have a fair amount of acid-base chemistry for this to work as well.